before you sit down, why don't you look left and right, just greet one another, say happy Sunday, good to see you, and then we will welcome Pastor uh, Josh to be in front of us to deliver the word. Hello. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. good to somewhat see you guys in the shadows over there, but good to see you. Good to be here. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Josh. I am uh, normally at the Pano campus, uh, except when I have the privilege to preach, then I'm everywhere. But otherwise, I'm normally, you can normally find the Pano campus. Well, nice to meet you. Uh, I see some faces I don't always see, so... Uh, Glad you're here, or glad that I can see you and be part of uh, this place with you. So, I have the privilege to uh, start a new series. We were kind of in the midst of the, I think actually it's been a while since I last preached. I think it was like, maybe May. <laughs> I, was in, I, was, I was gone for like two months, uh, almost, in the, for just on uh, traveling and paternity. Uh, and now I'm, I'm back, so good to see everyone. But, and I get to start the series. So it's called Handling Failures. We wrapped up last month's series, which was called what? Small is big. Huge. Yeah, someone said that. Small is big. That was the last series. Um, but we're still continuing in the book of Joshua. Although we will end with that today for a bit. And then next week, we're going to read something else. But we're still going to be talking about handling failure. Uh, hopefully, you have good knowledge on the story of Akan, who before the last series like even really knew who Akan was, the guy who sinned. Did you ever think you'd have a whole month dedicated to this one guy who sinned and caused everyone to, to suffer? And I, I, I honestly did not think of that, but hopefully you, 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 you see who Akan is, you see the, the, the consequences of that, and understand, right, that something small can, can become something big, and you're really able to ponder it this past month. Now, before we continue, I want, you to, I want you to pause for a minute and, and, and think with me. What, and think of maybe on not a so glorious memory, but when was the last time you, you tried to do something or you did something and you failed? Just think, maybe it's not pleasant. Maybe you, you were studying, you failed the test. Maybe you were trying to go somewhere on vacation that failed. Maybe you're trying to get a job and that failed. But what is something that just recently in your mind that you think of that you failed. You, you don't have to share it. <laughs> but just think about that. Let that, let that, let that, let that thought ponder in your head. Uh, maybe it's a, the, the common example, something you try to fail when you're doing. First time trying to ride a bike. When the first time you're, you're trying to ask someone out, you failed. You failed a class, you failed maybe investing your money, your portfolio goes down, your rental property doesn't work, your new business venture doesn't work. What I'm getting at is failure is a common theme of life, maybe. Maybe not for all of you. Maybe you succeeded at everything, then I need to learn from you guys. But failure is a common thing in life, right? We, we encounter failure quite often, I feel. <laughs> maybe that's just my life. <laughs> but there's lots of failures around the corner for different things, different extremes as well, but it's common. And uh, the, I, I said the first thing I, I talked about was riding a bike. And I, I remember very clearly to this day, the first time I was trying to ride a bike, and my dad was trying to teach me how to ride a bike, uh, the one of the trickier parts for like riding, this is like a, a no training of a bike, no, so you're just two wheels. The, the trickier part is learning how to balance. Right? When you're trying to learn how to ride a bike, it's like trying to learn how to balance. And I remember uh, we were going down a little slope, and on this slope, uh, my dad let me go. Because we thought, you know, we're getting, we're getting hang of it. And I remember, all I remember from that was I ended up in a bush. Like just, <laughs> I, I crashed, and I, I steered into a bush. And that, that's all I remember from learning how to ride a bike. Um, that's happy memory, I, I think. I'm, I'm happy to say, though, today I do know how to ride a bike, I think. But that's, that's one memory that really sticks in my brain, is how to ride a bike. Um, and can I click? Can you click for me, Renji? Oh. There you go. Okay. So uh, now, nowadays, my, my role is a little different. I'm trying to teach my son how to ride a bike. Uh, I'm a, I'm a put. I'm not sponsored, but I'm gonna put a, a promo out there. I say get a balance bike. I think balance bikes are like so smart because 
because balance bikes, they kind of, when, you're, when you're a kid riding a balance bike, you kind of learn by yourself how to balance. The, and for me, I think when you're learning to ride a bike, the tricky part is not pedaling, it's learning how to balance. So, so I, I, I wanted to put a video, but I couldn't figure it out. But this is a picture. Um, his feet are off the ground there, and you can tell. And he's, he's learned how to balance on the bike now just by himself. I'm going to tell you right now, I was, um, I think I was five or six when my dad started teaching me how to pedal and on two wheels. He's like two now, and he's like able to like go on the balance bike by himself. And now I'm going to ask you, though, uh, was there instances on something that you failed, that you failed so horribly at, that you didn't want to try again? Is there anything that you failed so badly at that you didn't want to try again? Maybe in that moment where your thought process was, oh, that was too hard, I'm not going to try again. Maybe your thought process was, maybe I can try it later, but I don't know. Or it's, ah, forget it, it's not hard enough. Maybe it's, I didn't pray hard enough. I didn't consult God hard enough. The thing is when failure comes, is sometimes when we fail once, the next time it becomes more difficult. Right? Once you fail once, the next time it becomes more difficult. So you see, he's, kinda, he's got the balance bike pretty, pretty well now, but uh, when we were learning, he, was, he wanted to try a, like next to our house is a slope. And he said, now go fast. He said it like that. He said, now go fast. He wants to go on this slope because he, he likes to go fast. And he tried once and he, he, he was able to you know, kind of ride down, but he, he tried to brake too fast by putting his feet down, and that ended up where he lost balance and he fell a couple of times after that. And after that, we, we tried again, and then the next time he didn't want to go because, you know, he, every time after, he felt he hurt, he fell down, and it hurt. And, and like I said, right, each time, there's a quote here that says, okay, the clicker's not clicking. Benji, do the honors. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, but the, 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 the sailor here is, failure often burdens the next attempt when someone tries to bounce back and try again. Right? The next time is harder because you remember the failure. You remember the struggle of what happened. He remembers multiple times falling down and hurting his hands or whatever. We wear helmets, we wear stuff, but it's not, it's not a pleasant thing. So maybe you're thinking now, does that mean he doesn't want to bike anymore? Pin that thought. We'll talk about that later in the sermon. Because um, today the title is, oh, it clicked now. The title is Godly Perspective on Setbacks and Failures. Godly Perspective on Setbacks and Failures. We're going to read from Joshua. Uh, oh, maybe it isn't clicking. Okay, Renji, next slide. Uh, Joshua 8, 1 to 2 first. Can I read for you? It says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. So, a similar thing happened in Joshua's journey, leading the Israelites into the Promised Land. Last month of Joshua 7, remember we talked about who? Achan. Uh, we discussed a great deal about um, how a small mistake caused something big, right? It caused them to fail and to, to, to lose. You okay? Okay, just, just checking. Um, because Achan disobeyed the covenant God had made with the Israelites about not taking the treasure. Read that during our, our, our offering verse, right? God said, do not take, and Achan did not obey. And here, as we continue, Joshua 8 tells the story of Joshua and the Israelites attempting a second time to fight the city of Ai. Here, they ultimately succeeded. Spoiler. Ultimately, they succeeded in, in the place that was marked for failure before. But what we want to take from this and realize from this passage we read was that Attempting a second time was not a natural thing for them. Let me say it again. Attempting a second time to take over the city of Ai was not a natural thing for them. Because we see here, we find that Joshua did not consult God 
about attempting a second time. Rather, it was God who said, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go. There was no mention in Scripture about Joshua. Hey, God, do we, do we try again after we, re- we sanctified? We've already, like, we've already stoned Achan. We've already sanctified ourselves. Do we try again? No, no, no. Even after all that, God had to be the one to tell Joshua. Because why? Because attempting a second time was not normal for them. So if we go to chapter 7, we'll read here, it says, So about 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down the slope. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Their hearts melted with fear and became like water. There's a couple things I want, I want to highlight, right? One, the first thing was how easy it was for them to lose heart from failing one time at I. I think the same can be said for us. Sometimes when we fail, right, we lose heart. We lose our faith because we failed one time. When there's a setback or failure, it becomes easy for us to lose heart, to lose the, the purpose, the focus. And I said it's easy because I want to I put into perspective what they lost. So, who likes math? A couple hands, nerds. Okay, I like math too. <laughs> it's all the engineers that raise their hands. I know that. that like, it's okay. It's okay. I, I'm there too. I like math. So, out of the 3,000 men, 36, 36 died. That's, what's, what's, what, what percentage is that? It's like 1%. 1%. A little more than 1%, right? That's, that's, I feel in war, 1% is very minute. That's like, okay, you know, someone got sick and died in the olden days, it's common. But 1% is not very, very big. Now, to give it even more perspective, in Numbers 26, 2, it says, take a census of the whole Israelite community by families, all those 20 years old or more who are able to serve the army of Israel. Can you guess how many people were in the total army of Israel? We have 3,000 they send, right? We have 3,000 they send. But how much is the total army of Israel? 100? 100,000? 600,000. 600,000. So, so the math on that, right? So 36 out of 600,000 people, that's like 0.005%. So not, not very big. Very, very small, very small. Okay, I'm not, I'm not belittling. People died, right? I'm not trying to belittle lives or anything. I want to <laughs> make it sure. It's not, it's not so much that people didn't survive, right? It's, it's more of the, the perspective, the, the, the understanding of how little it costs for them to lose heart, how, how weak our hearts are so that they, they melted in fear and became like water. 0.0005% of their army was lost. And this kind of plays back to what we talked about in the last month. Of something so small can become so big. Learning from failure is one thing, but rising and trying again after failure is another. Joshua and the Israelites' success in rising and trying again in Joshua 8 greatly depended on the Lord's command to tell them to go, take your army and fight. Through the Lord's command, we can learn a few things when we have faced and accepted the failure and are trying to rise again. And the first thing I want us to understand is this. Very dramatic. There you go. Okay. Um, Is your calling is bigger than your failures? Your calling. Can you say that to your neighbor? Your calling is bigger than your failures. You may say that to your neighbors to encourage them. (laughs) Your, <laughs> your calling is bigger than your failures. Sorry. It's important. Have you thought about that? That your calling is so much bigger than one failure in your life. Maybe you fail at something. Maybe you're, you try to start a new business. Maybe you're trying to, to, you know, even like try to bring life into the world. Your calling is bigger than your failures. Uh, it says here, let me read this verse, then... Then, 
It's bold. But then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, the people, city, and his land. The best news we can take is that after failures occurred and failures is faced, accept it and correct it. Right? We had to correct the failures. Right? We had to get rid of Akhan. They already sanctified themselves before the Lord. The best word we can see is then. Because that means they continue. Then we see that it was the Lord himself who wanted Joshua to continue. The Lord told him to go take the army. Because why? Because it was their calling to do what? It was their calling to take the promised land. It was their calling to conquer the land that God has set before them. And the Lord did not cancel. Oh, not that. Okay, the Lord did not cancel their calling because of their failure. Do we feel at times when we fail God, when we fail in life, that what's my purpose? Why am I still doing this? Do you feel disheartened? Because I think it's, it's, it's sometimes natural. Because us as humans, we don't, who likes to fail? I don't think anyone likes to fail, right? No one likes to fail. But it happens. But it's important for us to have the right frame of mind and understand, right, the Lord did not cancel their calling because of their failure. As long as they accepted and learned from the failure, their calling was greater than their failure at I. Could you imagine if we weren't allowed to make mistakes? If any time we failed, any time we fell short, that was it. Goodbye. No more. No more grace for you. No more sovereign. No more mercy. One thing I like to do when I fail at something is to zoom out. Is to look beyond what you just failed at. You zoom out. To look at it from the Israel's pers- Israelites' perspective, right? If they just stopped, they, they, they conquered I, right? Oh, no, no, they lost that I. If they would have paused, they would have zoomed out. They could see so many things. They could see how God delivered them out of Egypt, out of Pharaoh's hands. They could see how God took them through 40 years of the wilderness with nothing short of a miracle of feeding them what? Manna, quail. How they defeated the walls of Jericho simply by what? By walking around and blowing the trumpets. Like, to put it in perspective again, Jericho was like the, the big bad, the, that's the hardest one they had to conquer, was Jericho. And they did that by what? By just walking around. If they zoomed out, they can see how far God has brought them. That's just to name a few. Okay, if you know me, what's my favorite basketball team? Warriors. <laughs> the, the blasphemy. <laughs> you don't know me, don't you? <laughs> the, the Lakers are my favorite basketball team. My favorite player is Kobe. Kobe. Oh, guys, come on. My favorite player is Kobe Bryant. This, you're just trolling me now. You know my favorite player. Yeah. I know I'm, not, I'm in the wrong, the wrong town. But <laughs> for those that know, uh, this is Kobe. Um, I have to make a comment. So we get some kind of like slides from um, corporate about like how to like strum structure. And they had a slide also for, for Kobe. But the thing that annoyed me the most was they didn't even use a picture of Kobe Bryant in the background. They used a picture of Vince Carter. And I was like, the audacity. Sorry. But I had so, so I was very, I was very like, I was like, I was offended because, like, that's not even Kobe. And, and they, so, okay. But that is, that is Kobe. So my favorite basketball player is Kobe. I'm a Lakers fan. And if people think about Kobe, they think about, oh, he, he had a lot of success in his NBA career. He won a lot of championships. He, he was the clutch guy. He, he was the guy you didn't want to take the shot at the last second. Uh, that, was, that was, I think, what he was known for. He's known for his work ethic and all that stuff. But a lot of times what people don't put into perspective was when he first started in the league. Uh, first time in the league, he was drafted in like 1996. In 97, they made it to the Western Conference Finals. And in the Western Conference Finals, they were in the, I think, the final game, which, which they could have won. And you know what Kobe did in, those, in that last game? If you're a basketball fan from 1997. He shot four air balls. Not one, not two, not three, not four air balls in that Conference Finals game to go to the NBA Finals in 97. The first air ball was two seconds left in the fourth quarter, which would have won the game for them. Then he shot three or four air balls in overtime uh, to take the lead, to tie the game, and eventually they lost. Now, 
if I was a basketball player and I shot four air balls in a conference finals game, I think my 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 courage <laughs> or my 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 confidence thank you, my confidence my confidence my confidence might be a little bit a little lower than, than normal. Um, but you can see at the end of the game, uh, so there a reporter asked him, uh, Kobe, how do you feel like about those last you know, those those four air balls you shot in the game? And and Kobe did not feel ashamed. He said, I'm, I'm not ashamed. Uh, you got to get over yourself. It's not about you. Learn why you miss. Set up a plan to train better and focus on tomorrow. I don't think I could have said that in an interview if someone asked me after I missed four shots to, to win, to go to the finals. Uh, but the thing is, his eyes were on the calling. What was his calling? was to be the best basketball player that he could be. And, and that was greater because when your eyes are on the calling, failure will only get you closer to it. That was 1997, 2000, they did a 3 P 2000, 2001, 2002. They won three in a row. Uh, so, you know, it took another two years, but, and then he won two more. So he won a total of five championships. But I say this because when your eyes are on the calling, failures only get you closer to it. When you, when, you, when you take it into you to learn and grow from that. Uh, the next thing I want you... Oh, it's working. The next thing I, I want to talk about is to understand that you are bigger than your failures. You are bigger than your failures. One thing I want to note is that from this verse, right, it still says... He, this is God speaking to Joshua, right? After his failure at I... He still says to him, take the whole army with you, with you, and go up and attack I. God still told Joshua to go, right? He didn't abandon Joshua for a different general. He didn't decide to use someone else. But he still told Joshua, you, you are the commander. You go. And there was a process, I think, between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Right? There was a little sanctification. They wept. They, there was a process of what? Of him accepting his failures. Of course, God still encouraged him, right? But there was a process of accepting his failures, correcting it, and realizing that he has been blessed and he has been changed. Take note of that. That he has been blessed and he has been changed, and that he's able to bounce back a second time. Because why? Because you are not the same you dealing with the same battle. It's a different battle. It's a different you. You've grown. You've gotten better. And that the, the failures we encounter help shape us to conquer the things that we failed at in the past. Right? So to go back, I told you about the story about Zaxxon having the big ramp and going fast. So... After he failed a few times, he, he fell down, all that kind of stuff, we asked him, like, do you want to go again? And, you know, we, we were trying to ask him, do you want to try again? And he's like, no, got my own. And I was like, okay. And then, and then I was like, let's get you padding. Like, so when you fall, it doesn't hurt. Like, on the hands. We, we already used helmet, but, like, not like padding gloves, knees, and let's get you padding. Do you want to try again? No, okay. Uh, but eventually, eventually, like, he, after, after we kept practicing just, like, around the neighborhood, he would just go, and he got, like, he got like, I don't know, I feel like at two, I don't think I could have done that. <laughs> like, I'm seeing him just kick, and he's just like balancing and just like zooming along. And like, our driveway has a little bit of a ramp, and he's just going. And like, I said, okay, Tyson, you're like so good now. You've been practicing a lot. You want to try to go on the big one? I said, yeah, let's go. And like, oh, okay. It just took some time. And eventually, yeah, now he just, he just zooms down and goes fast, and he just circles and all that kind of, I'm like, wow, that's so cool. And so, so it took time. And, and we had to grow. He had to grow. He had to learn more. He had to get better. And eventually, he's like, I'm going to tackle it again, but I'm different. I'm better, and I can do it. And um, yeah, now he, he loves to go there more. And just like my, my favorite thing was, so there's a park near our house. And before, like when we tried to go to the park, it's about half a mile, give or take. We walked. He'd go on the bike, and he'd stop like a quarter of the way. He's like, I'm done biking. I'm tired. I can't bike anymore. And then guess who has to carry the bike and him? <laughs> one hand bike, one hand child. But like just <laughs> just yesterday, I was like, okay, you want to go to the park? He's like, yeah, let's go to the park. And we rode all like all the way to the park, over the hills and all that stuff. And he rode back all by himself again. I was just like, 
because I don't have to carry the bike and the child. But it's him growing. It's him understanding, like, I'm getting better at this. I can go faster. I can go slower. Of course, he still stops and gets distracted at every rock he sees or some, like, you know, something on the ground. But still, I didn't have to carry him, and he's able to go. But because he's not the same, he's getting better. And the last thing from this is understanding this, is that God is bigger than your failures. God is bigger than your failures. You may fail, you may feel small, you may feel insignificant, you may feel, why did I fail? But the perspective that you want to look at is that it is God is bigger than just that failure, than any of your failures. So I want to read some verses again. Um, I want to read from here first, from Joshua 7, 2 to 3, and then we're going to read from Joshua 8. I want, to, I want you to spot the difference here, right? So here, Joshua 7, 2 to 3, it says, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the, when, so, the, so the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. Joshua 7, right? We know what happened in Joshua 7. Joshua 7 is they failed. This is Joshua 8. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourself. Set an ambush behind the city. Skip to verse 8. It says, when you have taken the city, set it on fire, do what the Lord has commanded. See to it, you have my orders. What's the difference between the two? You can take the point that, well, yes, that is true. You can take the point of that is very true. But I, I had to look at it a bit more, and the, the big difference I see is that here in, in, in uh, oh, I have, you have global mission again. Uh, not here, but uh, can you go back to the, yes, here, right? We see that it's just Joshua who is sending the men out to eye. There was no statement of God telling Joshua to send out spies to the city of Ai. It was Joshua being like, okay, go and send out spies. And then when they returned, they told Joshua, the, the spies, oh, it's only a, a couple hundred people. Go send out a couple thousand men. That should be more than enough. Maybe it was the spies just feeling confident as well from, from beating Jericho. Wow. Like I said, Jericho was the city to beat. But what they did here was they just sent out 2,000 based on their own knowledge, their own power, their own understanding. They could have sent, I think, even all their troops, 100,000, and they still would have lost because they did not consult God first in their attempt to take the city of Ai. While here in chapter 8, we see, right, it says, do what the Lord has commanded. In that first, the verse 2 is God speaking to him. So the difference that I think is very important to note from the, earth, from the failure at I, of course there was the whole uh, stealing the, the treasure plunder from Jericho, which may have been avoided if, if they consulted to God first before going to I, hey God, we're going to conquer I, what do you want us to do? I want you to take out Akan first or have him repent first. If they would have done that, but they went without God without God's help to take the city of Ai. I'd like to ask the music team to come up as we're going to close. This is the first time in conquest that Joshua did anything of his own initiative without consulting God first. And it was doomed to failure. The great victory of Jericho, I think, made maybe the people overlook, maybe made Joshua overlook the value of God's help. But in chapter 8, we see, we see how God was the one who made them win the battle of Ai. Because why? Because God is bigger than our failures. In closing, I want to circle back to some of the first things that we talked about today. So I think it's important, right, to, to have the right frame of mind, understanding that failure is a part of life and we do encounter failure. But what is our response to it? What is the godly perspective of understanding failure and setback that we want to have? We want to understand what, that our calling 
is bigger than your failures. Because when we can see that what God has in store for them, it was to conquer the promised land. That one failure wasn't enough. It should not have been enough, and it wasn't enough. But understanding when we are in the midst of something that we're struggling with, with a setback, with something that's not going the way we want, let's take a step back. Let's zoom out. Let's see what the calling God has over your life. I'll tell you right now, the calling is a calling, a life of victory. That doesn't mean there will not be setbacks along the way. There won't be struggles along the way. There won't be failures along the way. But God has called you to a victorious life, a life that is set in Him. And your calling does not get canceled because of your failures. But that we are bigger than our failures, that we are called to grow and learn. And because of that, when we fail, we get something. We get better. We can ride our bike down the big ramp. And lastly, just understand that God, God is bigger than your failures. When we include God and ask for help, He will be the one to help us to conquer our failures. He will be the one to guide us, to give us strength, to give us the knowledge of what we need to do, as evidenced by Joshua here. Would you bow your heads with me this morning as I pray for us? Father God, I thank you so much for, for allowing us to fail in the first place. If we don't fail, we get too confident, we get too, too absorbed, too prideful. But you allow failures to shape us, to mold us, to let your work be done, to grow us in character, to grow our reliance on you even, God. Father, I thank you that we know that even though we stumble, we have setbacks in life, we fall, that your calling for us is still there that you have mercy, you have grace that extends to us, that extends to your people and that we will find victory in you, Father, as we include you in our plans, in our doings, in our daily life. I thank you in your most holy presence, Son's name we pray. Amen. Can I invite all of you to stand?